the issue is that you're looking at it as two scales, <laughs> but really the phenomena itself is a multi-scale phenomena. So people think, you know, life emerged at, at, at like a cell scale or something and cells, you know, reproduced and then radiated out across the planet. But really, um, you know, there's other theories of the origin of life that it was, um, you know, like biochemistry emerged from geochemical cycles. And then you start thinking about it more in terms of ecosystem scale or planetary scale. And so I think this idea, this very, it's a very reductionist idea that we think life is about individuals. And it's not actually about individuals um, at all. It's about um, information propagating along lineages. So a cell, even if you think about a cell as a structure, as an individual, a cell has to constantly rebuild itself. And it's using the information imprinted in the matter that it is to reconstruct itself. And then if you think about that extended over time, the structure that you call life is actually the structure that's extended out over time, basically the pattern that keeps reproducing itself in, in the material substrate. Um, so a lot of the discussions I have with colleagues, um, and in particular, this idea comes from Michael Lachman at Santa Fe Institute, is really to think about the fundamental unit of life as a lineage of information. And we're all just these kind of bundles of intersecting information, if you think about evolution. And I think this is really related to the problems associated to emergence. So just to, because I think people have removed time from consideration in the way we talk about both physics, because time is supposed to be an emergent property, right? Time doesn't exist at the fundamental scale. It has to emerge based on some properties of the second law or, you know, there's all these eras of time we talk about, like the cosmological era of time, the second law, the biological arrow of time, why is biology increasing? And they all tend to point in the same direction. And that's some big mystery in current physics because there's no fundamental concept of time. Um, but in biology, if you put time as being uh, more primary, I think it actually takes care of some of the issues of emergence. Because when you're talking about an object that has emergent properties, what you're really saying is that object has more time in it, um, where time is actually a physical attribute of the object. And this is something uh, that we're trying to do in assembly theory, because you think about like a molecule as being all the ways of assembling a molecule, which is basically looking at the structure across time. Um, and so then you can stack, you know, that whole hierarchy I did of, you know, going from atoms to molecules to cells to multicellular things to societies as actually being about how much time exists in an object. Um, and that brings in sort of the idea that evolution, sorry, my light went out, um, <laughs> um, actually is sort of fundamental to the way that we talk about uh, what life is in the sense that time actually has to be a part of the way you construct theories, that you actually think things exist across time. They're not just an individual instance that exists at that moment you're observing it. Well, yeah. One of the questions I have about assembly theory is that it could imply if there's some, you know, end of of the historical deviations from a previous state. Um, you know, let's say we get to the ultimate uh, evolution of society. You know, we we become university professors, and you know, that's the pinnacle of evolution. Yeah. You know what the proof is, by the way, that we have the best job in the world, Sarah. You know what the proof of that is? What? What did the man who achieved the highest heights literally in history, namely Neil Armstrong, walking on the moon, what did he do after he retired from walking on the moon? He became a professor. <laughs> I see. So, so let, let's stipulate that's the highest form of evolution. Now, okay. if you then reach kind of a, sta a stasis, you know, I can agree that there's more complexity in a uh, in, in Darwin's warm little pond, which we'll get to, than there is in just water molecules by themselves. So assembly theory would say there's more information, more stored memories, et cetera. Right. Um, but you know, eventually that comes to some stasis, but time doesn't cease. So how how can you reconcile those two facts? In other words, without knowing what comes next after societies, um, you know, then then or collectives. Um, that time can then continue to progress in a way that the biological, psychological, cosmological, all the different arrows of time would agree that, yes, time is progressing if you reach some maximum stasis? Um, so I think part of the... This, this is a really interesting question. So one of the things I've been doing a lot of thought experiments on is what does a clock look like in assembly theory? But I, I don't have, like... And Lee and I have been debating about that. But... Um, but I think um, one of the key points is if you think that there's an ordering of events, like I can't spontaneously fluctuate out of the vacuum, which current theories of physics might say could happen, and I, I think is actually a logical impossibility. So, so sometimes, so where, where it gets interesting talking about life is where we have had a tendency in the past to take 
theories of physics and draw them to like their logical end state and then accept that that's actually a real possibility in our universe, even though it's ludicrous. And then you come at it looking at from the perspective of life and you really see why it's ludicrous. So there's like this idea of Boltzmann brains or anything is possible to flux, spontaneously fluctuate into existence. And part of the sort of argument that we would make in assembly theory is no, that's not possible because you actually need the specific sequence events to make that object. There had to be causal structure in place, things that you might call constructors or however, whatever language you want to use, information in the system to actually assemble that specific object. So you can't just get a Sarah for free. You have to go through the 4 billion years of evolution to get to an object like me. Um, so even if I was static and I never changed in the future, you would still have that four billion year time point. But the but part of the point is also I I have to constantly reassemble myself to exist. So I'm not a static object. I'm I'm a a thing that is constantly reconstructing myself, you're constantly reconstructing yourself right now. So even if you're just sitting there and you're not doing anything, your body is metabolizing. I'm like Madonna. I'm always reinventing yeah. myself. That's right. <laughs> Material girl. Um <laughs> I'm also a material girl, but I like Roger Penrose's perspective that he doesn't know what the material is. And um, I think that's probably pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I think um, when you think about it from that perspective, I don't think that the traditional notion that things can be static in time actually even makes sense. Um, and so part of the, the way um, you know, we're playing with ideas is, is this causal structure, if you want to call it ordering in time, is the fundamental thing. And that universe is constantly assembling itself into the next quote unquote state. Although I don't really, I, I think states are kind of a weird thing that we talk about in physics for various reasons, but the next thing that exists. Um, so, so the universe is constantly moving forward in time, but it exists in the current moment, right? So it's that assembled moment. So, so there's not really for things to persist, right? Like why does something exist across time um, it actually becomes an active process, not a static one.